Hello, friends. Welcome to our weekly data talk, a show where we talk with data science leaders from around the world. Super excited today to chat with Andre Burkhoff. He is the machine learning team leader at Gartner, and he just wrote a book called The 100-Page Machine Learning Book. He, is, he has an amazing academic background. He has a PhD and master's of science degree in computer science with a, with a focus on artificial intelligence. Andre, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thanks for inviting. So Andre, um, can you share a little bit about your academic journey with us? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, I uh, was born in Soviet Union, and uh, my school was like like classical Soviet school. And uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I my family uh, found it, uh, itself on the in Ukraine, which is like new new country, um, one of the pieces of the Soviet Union. So I did my uh, bachelor's and master's in computer networking in uh, Sevastopol, in Crimea, um, and then I worked it for, um, well, I'm, I started my own startup and I worked on it for about three years and, until the crisis of dot-coms. Um, and after this, the crisis of dot-coms, I decided that uh, I wanted to do something important, but because the crisis affected so much the IT industry that uh, in Russia and Ukraine, it was very hard to start anything. So mm -hmm. I decided to um, move to uh, some other more developed country and the best alternative that I found on, uh, was uh, Canada. Um, initially, we wanted to immigrate to France, but we easily, uh, quickly realized that me and my, my ex-wife, we quickly realized that uh, it's not as easy to, um, to get uh, like immigrated to France, so Quebec, uh, French French speaking province in Canada was like the best alternative and uh, the first thing I tried is to find a job in, uh, in Quebec but I quickly realized that my language was uh, not enough to uh, to like efficiently communicate with with people uh, 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 on the job so I decided to go to uh, study and I started uh, just like a like a um, uh, graduate program of uh, uh, in uh, in computer science, but then um, one of the professors uh, who was uh, who led the uh, um, a, uh, a lab in machine uh, multi agent systems, uh, he uh, offered me uh, uh, to do a master's with 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 him. So I I started to work on masters in two thousand seven. And then, uh, without uh, like finishing masters, they offered me to like uh, uh, step to uh, uh, to a to a PhD program in in, in multi agent system. So my my thesis uh, in PhD thesis was about uh, multi agent systems and more particularly uh, repeated uh, uh, games. You know, like the prison is prisoners, the prisoners dilemma game, where uh, or like the, where the Nash equilibrium. Uh, is a solution. So I actually work it on uh, computing this Nash equilibrium in different uh, games that are repeatedly played by by the same two players. So the idea was to act, either learn to collaborate effectively uh, for two robots on the same task, or to compete effectively one versus another. Wow. I mean, you, you just shared a whole bunch of really fascinating things about your life. Um, um, I want to go back to um, your journey as you were um, switching schools and deciding to go to school in Canada. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, I mean, first of all, the fact that you have a strong background in different languages and then like learning English and then like going to a doctoral program. Um, in a language that's not native to you, how was that for you? Well, first of all, in, in Quebec, uh, all education is normally done in French. Uh, the only exception is my, uh, the University of McGill, uh, where the education is, is English and some colleges for English uh, speakers. Uh, but uh, as an immigrant, uh, you are like uh, restricted by law that you have to go to French-speaking uh, education uh, establishment. So my French oh. was, yeah. So my French was quite low, but I really wanted to learn French. This is why we initially 
targeted France, but uh, eventually changed it for, for Quebec. So yeah, I would say that uh, the first uh, several weeks, uh, I just tried to understand the words, but the meaning of those words was like uh, uh, difficult to catch. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think after th uh, three or four weeks, you get used to the accent of every uh, professor uh, who uh, whose classes you you take, and eventually you start write you start you start writing the words, and then when you go get home get home you reread re the words and you start getting the uh, the sense of, of it. So it's like watching movies on Netflix, for example. I always watch it movies in Russian until I. I, I start li started to li uh, live in Canada, and then I started to watch movies in in English. And in the beginning, it was hard to follow the the the, the plot of the film, and at the same time to like uh, get get the ple pleasure of, do of doing this because you are always like struggling. Okay, what did he say? Why did he do it? <laughs> but now I, I watch movies in English with uh, with pleasure, and I actually prefer to watch movies in 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 English because. You see the you 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 hear the the true voice of actors, and when the actors are great, the voice is great too. Mm. Well, I, I love that about you, Andre. It just shows how gritty you are that you're willing to do whatever it takes to learn. And mad props to you for um, getting into these classes and you know forcing yourself to learn quickly. I mean, talking about you know basic French, we're talking about high level French, college level French, and also. Yeah. <laughs> about about things like computer science and high, you know high level mathematics so this is like very technical language that you adapted to very quickly um i spent just to give you some background like i only speak english and mm -hmm. i took five years of spanish in college okay. in, in college and i don't my spanish is terrible <laughs> and you like just leapt right in and just like learned a, a brand new language at a very high level and just adapted well, I would say that our brain is a fascinating uh, organ. We may, we might underestimate it because we always like when we are born in some conditions and we always remain in the, in those conditions. We could say, well, everything is simple, and uh, we don't make a, a huge effort to actually like adapt. But once you are in a situation where a quick uh, adaptation is needed our brain can can actually do miracles so uh, i think that uh, for example like language learning you say that you have got you have done like five years but if yeah. you go to uh, let's say to mexico and you spend just a month talking with natives you will see how quickly your brain will get used to uh, speak directly in, fr in in spanish without doing this translation uh, first or how your brain will quickly uh, understand what people say, and you will not do this translation for yourself. Like it will be, it will, con mm. will convert in direct knowledge. Like an example that I give everyone, and everyone says, "Wow!" is when I when uh, we moved to Canada, we bought a computer with a keyboard where only Latin uh, uh, letters were printed. But to communicate uh, with my parents, I had to type uh, in Russian. But because I didn't have Russian letters on my keyboard, I ordered like these stickers with Russian letters that you can uh, uh, stick to uh, to the keys. But because like at the time uh, eBay was not as fast as today, mm. we had to wait like for two or three weeks. So I just tried to type uh, on the English keyboard Russian words, and my fingers just automatically typed correct words. Oh. I, I couldn't type the precise letter. For example, you tell me type type me this letter. I couldn't. But if I imagine a word in my in my head, my fingers find right care right um, keys. Uh, wow. Yeah, this is how I I I, I, I managed to not use stickers. Most Russian uh, immigrants or people from other countries cannot type in their native language because they don't have native uh, characters. Wow, I, man! Well, it's amazing uh, how quickly you adapted and and learned uh, these different languages. How, Andre? Um, are there other languages you also you also know? Well, uh, Russian is my native language. Uh, yeah. 
I learned uh, English in uh, in high school and in university in uh, back in Ukraine, and uh, I I uh, learned French partially in Ukraine when we prepared to uh, to move to Canada. But of course, uh, like my French would never be uh, the same level if I just stopped like after learning to read and. Uh, communicate with my classmates. Uh, when you move to another country and you see people speaking with so many accents, I, I, like an example, I thought that my French was already good. And we moved to some um, building, apartment building with uh, 12, uh, 12 stories. And my apartment was on the uh, ninth, uh, uh, ninth floor. And almost every time when I went to university, we I met with an old couple, uh, like uh, uh, of retirees. And on the way down, they tried to to communicate with me. And when she spoke, I was quite yeah sure no problem. But when him yeah. tried to like add something, ask me something something, I was like completely out of idea what what she just mm -hmm. said. He just said. <clears throat> And I, 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 what, what, I was he talking. Was he, was he talking like really fast? No, it's it's just different accents because in in Canada oh. and in, in Quebec in particular, uh, there are multiple accents of French. For example, the accent oh. of uh, French on on the TV can vary from one uh, channel to another. For example, there are more like international uh, French channels. They try to speak with uh, international accent of French. But there oh. are channels oriented on like uh, middle class uh, or w worker class, and their their accent uh, they are very different. And wow. people coming from different regions of of Quebec sometimes cannot understand one another because the accent of French is so different in Quebec. Wow. Well, I, wow. I, I can imagine that, for example, and I don't know people from Texas and people <laughs> from New York maybe. <laughs> sometimes can get some difficulties in understanding one another yeah that that that, that um that might be true yeah I, I see what you're just saying with the accents well that's fascinating and um well i love the fact that i mean all this just sh shows how gritty you are um and also how quickly you adapt which is super important for anybody who's in data science so when you were um and i want to get to uh your brand new book that you've written um, getting all this praise from the data science community, uh, which you happen to write in English. Um, your um, so you 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 finished your PhD in computer science, focusing in on artificial intelligence. Uh -huh. At that point, did you know what you wanted to do next? Uh, I know what I didn't want to do next. I didn't want to spend the next. Uh, Three to ten years uh, on you know, by doing different postdocs in different piece, uh, places um, in the world. If I was uh, like alone, young and uh, wild, I could do it. But I I was married with two kids that I've got when I did my my PhD. Mm -hmm. So I I didn't want to move with my young kids from one country to another, find schools, uh, change languages for them. It would be difficult. So I decided that I didn't want to stay in academia, but I actually like my the, my aspiration was to start my own company around machine learning, artificial intelligence. But uh, you know that uh, when you have family starting something, it's, it's not as easy as it, as it might uh, might seem. So I decided to get some more experience uh, in industry before I start I start something uh, myself. And I went to um, uh, to work. Uh, I, I uh, started working at Fujitsu. Fujitsu it's like an international uh, Japanese international uh, multinational company, which had the uh, office uh, a research and development uh, facility in Quebec. And I worked for them for two years. But I quickly realized that I don't like to work on multiple projects uh, at the same time because Fujitsu was a consulting company, so they they uh, com com competed against other consulting company uh, for mm -hmm. government contracts or for some uh, in insurance company contracts. And I, I started to realize that I really like to work focused on something uh, like something big, but always the same. 
And one, uh, in, after two years uh, with Fujitsu, I, I just found a small uh, company uh, uh, called uh, Wanted Technologies, who actually worked on a very fascinating product, which was ahead of time, I, I think. It was a product where um, the system downloads job postings all over the internet and analyzes them automatically. For example, what is the salary offered? Where this, this job is offered? Uh, what kind of skills are, are, are required? Uh, like, we need to normalize title. We need to predict what kind of occupation uh, it is about. And cool. there were so many things that can, can be extracted out of a job posting. And especially if you imagine that uh, you do some uh, international expansion, you, you can add all difficulties related to multiple languages, translation, uh, for many job postings uh, are bilingual, so you have to detect where English ends and French starts, for example. Oh. So a lot of problems, but all around one big project, big product. And I really love the idea, and uh, I uh, sent my uh, my resume to to them, and they uh, hired me. Like I was the first uh, machine learning expert uh, expert hired by this company, but they already were quite big. So they managed to do everything we do today with machine learning, but they managed to do it like without any knowledge of machine learning. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, when, when I came there, I said, wow, there is so much I can do because the, you, you do things, you, good, you do really fascinating things, but you don't do it this in the state of the art way. So, uh, I, I, and since then, since 2007, I am to, uh, still working for this company, but this company was first bought by one, inter well, one American company called CEB, and one year later, CEB was bought by Gartner. So this is how I, I get, uh, I get, <laughs> I get in, in mm. So yeah, but I, I changed three companies without changing my. Uh, my <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> well, that's cool. How did you manage like the culture changes? Uh, well. Uh, we, uh, it was difficult in, 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 in some sense that uh, CB when they bought us, they tried to like convert us into their culture. But people here uh, loved so much to work the way we worked it before mm -hmm. that many many resistance uh, started to happen. We lost uh, quite good specialists because uh, the approach of CB was quite co uh, cowboy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when uh, Gartner bought CB, uh, we, uh, we we really felt like Gartner wants to uh, leverage what is the what is the best in us, uh, what is the know-how that we have. They want to like reinforce uh, teams to make them more efficient, add additional resources, financial uh, people, and so on. So I, I think that Gartner uh, really knows how to uh, like cherish uh, the, the exceptional talent because you can imagine in Quebec City uh, there is no so much uh, talent uh, in machine learning and AI and data science in high frequency computing. Everything what we do is unique and we learn it to do it uh, on ourselves. We didn't learn it in Stanford or in, in MIT, MIT or Carnegie Mellon University. So everything we, we know we learn it hard way. So uh, like trying to convert us to something else would be a big mistake. Well, it sounds like you have a great culture there and um, you're working with an amazing group of people. Uh, what what sort of um, machine learning learning products do you like working on? Uh, well, um, I think that the most of machine learning that my team uh, work on is about text processing because uh, uh, the most of our input is job description, which are in, 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 in text. So in text processing, we, uh, we normalize, uh, let's say, uh, titles, because you can, you can write, like, uh, in the job description, titles can contain noise, for example, salary information, or um, uh, job, uh, job number, or location. All those pieces don't belong to, to the title. So, we work on machine learning algorithm that will remove the title, uh, all noise, but keep the title. Then the, another problem is to normalize titles. For example, some in, in some um, job uh, board, uh, some recruiter could type, uh, we look for a director of, of uh, research and development. 
Yeah. And another job board, uh, another person working for the same company could type, we look for a um, research and development director. So, yeah, or, yeah, or like head, head of research or... Yeah, so it's like, it, it, it's basically the same, uh, it's the same posting, what we call posting, but we have to merge those postings together based on the similarity of title, location, time span, when it was posted and so on. So if the title is not normalized, we will count these two postings as, as, as different postings. So we, we, we try to uh, normalize titles so that uh, they look the same. Uh, skill extraction, for example, uh, uh, extract salary, it was a huge project because uh, in every country, the way people write salary is different. Uh, even, even if you take uh, Uni United Kingdom and US and Australia, um, in Canada, mm. it will be four different uh, ways of, of right salary information. So we cannot just hard code some regular expressions and apply them blindly. So what we did is we actually trained uh, two statistical models. One statistical model uh, analyzes every number and some, some surrounding words and decides whether this number with those words is actually a salary or not looking in the in the context okay mm. and once uh, the first model says yes i think it's it's a salary we have another model that takes every every token or every word every every uh, like um, uh, character in in this string and ass uh, assigns a label to every token for example if it's written like 45k a year then the machine will say that 45 means thousands mm. but if it's written uh, the salary will be uh, 20 uh, dot uh, 25 slash hour then the machine has to annotate 20 as units and not as thousands and when you start working on international for example in china mm. there are there are numbers completely crazy for wow. us as westerners for example they use some character which means ten thousands so the salary can be like five ten thousands and oh. the, so you have to <laughs> predict wow. that five is actually hundred thousands and the, what is remaining is ten thousands in in, uh, in in india there are lux lux is hundred thousands and they use lux everywhere for example your salary will be two dot five lux and you have to understand that two dot five lux two means hundred uh, tens of uh, no, hundreds of thousands so uh, every country is, is particular when you, when you train it in machine learning way you avoid like programming complex instruction rules manually and the code uh, remains very short and clean and when something doesn't work you can just throw more training examples into the system and it will learn to distinguish between uh, good and wrong. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, as you said, like moving into the international job markets and how those different postings are being put out there. Um, yeah, dealing with different monetary figures, different ways that things are worded. Um, certainly certain titles are the same, but they're just worded differently. All yeah. that, um, this is fascinating. So. Um, as you're analyzing and, and using these different statistical models and machine learning, what is kind of your, like one of your goals with this project? Um, what, what do you mean? Oh, I'm sorry, like, are, are you, so as you're analyzing all these job postings, uh -huh. is, is like one of the goals to look for like trend, like job trends? Yeah, okay, or? well, yeah. So what the company does, uh, is a uh, analytics platform uh, where our clients, which are mostly like any company you can name uh, are our clients, uh, they actually use our platform to um, uh, focus their search for a specific talent. For example, um, our system can say that if you look for Java developer in Chicago, the complexity of hiring this, this, uh, this profile is, uh, let's say, 70 on the scale of uh, 100. But if you look at in New York, for example, the same profile, the complexity would be, let's say, I don't know, 50. So when the company like Amazon, uh, everybody heard that Amazon wanted to open a, a new uh, headquarters mm -hmm. somewhere, uh, 
they need to have this information about the availability of workforce, uh, how easy it is uh, to, to get specific specialists. So if they see that if we open uh, the office in this specific location, uh, it will be hard to find good managers. So even if it's full of engineers, so there is no one to, uh, to, uh, to manage them. So they have to find like an optimal place. And uh, this is one of the use cases. Another use case is just to understand, uh, like I'm a recruiter, where should I post my uh, announcements uh, to, uh, to attract uh, talent and uh, do it as fast as possible. For example, you look in, in, in New York and in New York there are different neighborhoods and you can say like in this specific neighborhood, uh, it's more hard, but if you look here, there is a smaller university, but there is a computer science program, so uh, there is a quite uh, high supply, and there is not so much competition in this area, because we, we know also who competes against who. So ma many companies pay us to know, for example, two years ago, did Microsoft uh, hire this specific profile? And if yes, and if it's, it was in good, in big numbers, it actually makes sense to contact uh, people in Microsoft that have this profile on LinkedIn and offer them a, a change. Because normally people assume that uh, people are ready to, to, to do a, a move to another company between something like uh, one year and a half and three years. So if you know that you, some company hired a lot in some region, you can like source people in this company uh, and with high chance to 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 to, to succeed. Well, that that is uh, that is fascinating and it's amazing that you know you're you're heading up these projects and obviously it's providing tons of value uh, for recruiters and companies that are looking to open up new offices or uh, build up their their um, their staff with the appropriate um, types of people. What what it was like for you? Um, um, as you've gone through these transitions and moving into leadership roles, what was that like for you? Well, the, the reason, uh, because I, I'm tink, uh, tinkerer, what, what, what they say. So I like really like uh, have my hands dirty when I work uh, on some projects, uh, on, pro on most projects. But I quickly realized that if you want to, um, uh, to work on big projects, if you want to scale, if you want to deliver something uh, regularly, it cannot be like uh, one uh, person show. You have to uh, delegate, you have to uh, uh, attract complementary talent, for example, better developers than myself or people who know uh, machine learning better or have more experience with, with neural networks. So you, I just start feeling that uh, I am limited like any, any other human being and um, I, I, I started to like express uh, my desire to have uh, have another team member who would work with me, and uh, we were 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 very lucky to hire my first uh, team member, and she was very uh, very, very talented, and she still uh, she's still working with us, and uh, like right now I expect uh, a new uh, team member uh, who has. Um, and got a PhD in, in, in machine learning here in, in, in Quebec, who has many public publications and lots of programming experience. So we are lucky to, to get such people on board. And I think the fact that I uh, worked on my book uh, in so open way, like on LinkedIn, when I posted uh, news about every chapter and I asked people to, uh, to read drafts and send me updates, all this created a lot of buzz about myself personally, person, personally, and I think it's like right now for me it's much easier to attract people into my team because Gartner uh, has a renome uh, in the world as a IT consulting uh, or IT knowledge company, but it's not considered like a cool company to work and do some AI. So. My team is, is, is quite an exception, uh, even, even within Gartner. So when you say that Gartner looks for a machine learning uh, expert or uh, data scientist, people who don't know what specifically Gartner does will say, well, I'm not sure. But if, they, uh, if I say that I am Andrei Burkov, the author of um, uh, the bestseller machine learning book, 
it's much it's much easier to attract talent. So I am really so so to answer your question, how how did I get there? Once I started to work with people who are really good at what they do, I really love the, the feeling. I really love mm -hmm. the feeling when I ask someone to do something and the, I see like the eye the mm -hmm. eye of the, of the person starts like shining and they they start to generate lots of ideas, try stuff, try try to annotate data to to create the first model, then iterate, improve it. I I just love the feeling to to see people uh, like to get excited about what we do. So before, when I was alone, I I, I couldn't share this feeling with anyone else. Mm. Everyone everyone like took me for some crazy scientist, especially crazy <laughs> Russian, crazy <laughs> Russian scientist. But now, uh, because we are a team, and I also have people in India, so mm. we, uh, we, we're quite a um, big team, so we always deliver something. Of course, not all projects got to production, even if we succeed, uh, like, you know, for example, Netflix Prize, uh, the, the, the team who won the prize, like, actually offered the best solution, but it was so complex that Netflix said, no, no way, it will not go into oh. production. Yeah, so the team who won this one million prize, uh, their solution never was used in, in production. So there is a huge difference between what data scientists can deliver and what can go into production. So we as a team, I see myself and my team as like in between. We are not purely data scientists. We, we don't require like give us numbers and we will build some beautiful models. We actually uh, work with the raw data we annotate this data manually ourselves. We uh, actually uh, implement uh, our uh, models in, in form of, let's say, uh, uh, RESTful web services that, like a black box, you send an input and you get an output. And we try to make our model work super fast, like, for example, uh, tens, uh, like, uh, tens of a second or even hundreds of a second. Because you can imagine we download uh, every week, more than 20 million uh, job descriptions. Wow. So if 20 million uh, it every week? Like, it was like uh, seven, several months ago, maybe today even more. <laughs> so wow. you can imagine that if I write an extractor of salary and it takes a second to extract uh, the salary from a job, we will never be able to uh, analyze so many, uh, so many mm. job descriptions. So we have to be smart and we have to be fast and this is something that i think is the biggest asset of my company my my team within the company wow what you know one of our one of our big questions that we get in our data science community on facebook is um you know how how can i interview you know to get the job and you know you're in a really unique spot because not only are you building teams uh machine machine learning teams but also you're analyzing job descriptions. So I'm really curious about your your process for yeah. finding the right team members. Well, um, um, I recently did an uh, AMA or a AMA uh, on Reddit about my book uh, and people ask it me uh, uh, like what I have to like, what kind of profile I, ha I, I yeah. have to be to be considered like member of your team or to be considered as a good candidate? And I was hon I, I, I was honestly uh, saying that, well, for my team, I look for people with either a computer science background or without computer science background, but with uh, proven uh, programming background, for example, working as a software, software uh, engineer for some company mm -hmm. for several years. This is important because if you don't program, you can do some data science, but you're very limited with the graphical uh, uh, interface tools. Um, this is the one. And the second one, I look for something unusual in, in a profile. So mm -hmm. it can be anything. You can of course, build a drone that navigates itself based on GPS coordinates. This is awesome. But it could be also, I learned uh, Japanese on my own, or mm. I, I learned to play guitar, and uh, I, now I, I have a band. Anything which is unusual, 
becomes interesting because it shows that your the brain of the person is not like they tell me what to do and I, I do stuff. Mm. I, I, I look for people who don't wait to be told what to do, who generate ideas uh, by, by themselves. Of course, not all of those ideas uh, are good. I don't even say that all my ideas are good, but at least I see that the person actually appropriates the project uh, uh, they are assigned and uh, actually wants to build something uh, something unique uh, by applying the, the unusual way of thinking. So yes, of course, machine learning knowledge, data science, uh, all that is important too. And uh, on the interview, I actually ask a lot of machine learning questions and I ask for people to write code on the whiteboard uh, for some, for some uh, enigma questions like, whatever but uh, I think to interest me to get invited to the interview I look for those uh, uh, unusual things uh, in the in the resume I think that's really cool the way you I like the way you phrased it um, you're looking for people that aren't don't need to be told what to do that they can come up with projects on their own they can be innovative and because um, that's sometimes where the, the cool ideas come from because like you said, like you, Andre, you know, you come, you come, you have all these different ideas, things you want to do, but you also want to get the team. You want to find out what are they thinking about? Yeah. What are some methods we can, we can solve this problem? And that requires creativity. That requires somebody who's willing to put themselves out there. And, but finding those curious, gritty people, that's like very difficult to gauge that on a resume, yeah. right? And I guess what you're saying is those unusual things can help to point to this person is different. They don't. They don't just have the skill set and the talent to work with programming or statistics, but they're also um, they have something else. They have an edge because of their their curiosity or their drive in some other area. Yeah, especially it counts a lot for junior uh, applicants because juniors say that it's like um, a chicken and the egg problem. Everyone wants experience but they don't hire without experience. So where, where do, I, do I get this experience? So when I, I hire for a junior position, because it's, uh, we, we see that hiring people with a lot of experience in machine learning, it's quite complicated. They, they are rare and they uh, don't easily accept any offer because they already love what they do. So I think the best way to uh, build a strong team is to attract young talent and because they are young, basically their resumes are all the same. I went to this school, I went to this university, I participated in this uh, project and something like this. So when you receive like 10 applications and most of them just like tell you the university names and uh, mm -hmm. uh, cities, it's hard to choose. But once you, I see that, oh, I, I play violin, violin and I won international competition. It, it, it has no relationship to, to the data science whatsoever. But I see that this person lived an, an ordinary life. And because of this, uh, this person has to have an, an ordinary way of thinking. At least it, it, it's something that I expect to have. Of course, after this, after this, there is an interview and formal question and so on. But if you unique in some way, there are high chances that you are unique in something else uh, too. If you cannot show that you are unique, I would assume that you are not. At least, uh, mm. well, when I have, I cannot interview ten people uh, because every interview is about between two or three hours. So, oh after, wow, yeah, That's a long interview. Yeah, well, because. We only have one interview. It's not like uh, like at Google at the time you had to have like five or six or seven <laughs> okay, gotcha. different people, and they ask it ridiculous questions like how many uh, tennis balls there is in a school bus. We don't ask this kind of question. <laughs> we only have one interview, and it's technical, and it covers both machine learning uh, and, and programming part. 
And we also, I also ask uh, the key people in the company, like directors of different uh, different uh, teams, to join and just uh, ask some questions from their domain and see how the person reacts, especially to the questions that they don't know much about. So it's just one interview, and I want to know everything uh, uh, after this interview. So I try to in invite people really like who in, who pick my curiosity by something even playing guitar it was like on reddit guy a guy said my god i always <laughs> thought that i my myself playing guitar doesn't uh, like means nothing but uh, i will try to put it on my resume and i say yes you you have to because it's a distinction yeah no doubt after after the conversation i'm going to go back to my linkedin profile now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you um, can put your your um, your Spanish class there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my Spanish weakness. Um, <laughs> it's so funny that you talked about the, the Google the random uh, Google questions we hear about from interviews from back in the day. It's funny I was talking to this one uh, data scientist, and he says that he intentionally will ask like one kind of bizarre question, kind of a Google question, not to. Um, really see how creative they are with how they're going to get to the answer or come to an answer, uh, mm -hmm. but really to to find out, will they will they choose a common sense answer? For example, he'll ask a crazy question, mm -hmm. and he, he, what he really wants for the, is for the person to pull up their phone and Google the answer. He's okay. like the obvious thing, like just Google it. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes yeah. that's, you know, he's like, yeah. he's not looking for you to know it. He's just kind of like, will you actually Google and find out the answer and tell me like in a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I myself uh, to test uh, the person in some unusual situation, I like to ask um, two kind of questions. The first one, okay, explain me how this thing works and the, the person explains. And now explain me why it works, okay? So mm. you know how, but explain why, okay? This is one. And the second one is, okay, let's say, you uh, you take this specific algorithm and you know how it works but if i change this for that will the algorithm still be workable and if yes why if not why so and this i see how the person actually masters masters the the, the knowledge either because the knowledge can be of two types one is just you like prepared for an exam you pass the exam and you forget like mm -hmm, everybody mm -hmm. does and another kind of knowledge is a deep understanding and one the, the person two person under answer the same question the answer can be the same but one person can have the, this deep understanding and another person would just uh, memorize uh, answers because today online there are so many uh, web pages like data science interview questions how to answer them and so i i'm not sure when the, uh, the person answers what that the person actually has this deep knowledge that's fantastic and um i think yeah that why question really gets to the heart and that's where you really see the gears turning right how they're actually thinking about I it think, i think and, the why question is actually what um, what made of us who we are i mean us as a humanity because we always question it why this happens why apple falls uh, on the earth uh, and we discover things and it's also the questions that makes us unhappy in, ma in many cases because sometimes when you cannot answer this question why or you start questioning like why do i do what i do uh, why do i do it this way and, and mm -hmm. i know that other people do does it differently and you can ask your your manager like let's change the, this way of doing things because i ask it this question why and i actually don't understand uh, why we do it this way and in many companies the answer will be because because it mm -hmm. works so it's really mm -hmm. hard for it for a wide kind of people to work for companies that like follow rules for follow traditions so I try in, in my team and I think Gartner in, in general, we try to collect all those whys and we try to really improve our processes based on those whys. Because if those whys aren't answered, uh, 
even the most intelligent people will start uh, getting uh, like not feeling like they uh, they uh, they do what they have to do. I think it's really good that you. Um, I love that style of leadership that you that you have, where you are encouraging your team to ask why. Because sometimes people can be really offended, right? That you have a certain process in place. The company does something a certain way and you follow it. But as time goes on, there might be better ways of doing things. And you might have some younger team members who come on board or like, and you're like, Andre, you're like, no, please tell me. Like uh -huh. if, you, if you have better ways of doing this, please question. Yeah. Please ask why. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, like there are bossy, bossy bosses like uh, like those who uh, um, like like to just tell people what to do as i said i prefer people telling me what they want to do and when i ask people like a member of my team like i would like to you to solve the, this problem this way yeah if i don't have any question like why this way i have a better idea then okay i think that uh, the person agrees with my point if the person says, well, could you explain why you think it's a, it's a good solution? I always explain, I, I'm always uh, open to explain my way of thinking. And then it could be a conversation between me and the, and the person mm -hmm. like, uh, okay, the person feels like it would be better to do differently. And I will listen to, to, to this explanation. And we, I, I am always open to say, yeah, you know, your your idea is, is actually better than mine, so go on, try it. If it doesn't work, uh, the fallback solution will be mine. Uh, but it's some it's sometimes uh, we cannot agree. Like I think this this thing is better, and uh, my employee think this thing is better. I think that in this situation, uh, as more senior leader, I have to make a decision. It can be the decision uh, to take this, uh, the, 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 what uh, the, my team member or, or proposes, or it can be like, no, try what I ask you to do. And in many cases, I'm right. It happens that I'm wrong, but uh, because, uh, well, uh, we are not a de de democracy. We can, yeah. talk, we can talk about uh, the problem, we can uh, discuss, but at yeah. the end of the day, I am responsible for delivering so mm -hmm. if I'm not sure that my team member works on something uh, the right way, I cannot commit uh, to deliver this specific thing. So it, 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 this is the hardest part of being a manager because uh, when, you, when you are a scientist, there is only one solution which is right because you can prove it. And being a scientist is being able to prove your theory. But in business, and I actually learned this the hard way, opinion matters and once if the company uh, values opinions of like higher people in the hierarchy uh, this company will not go and uh, go, go very very far but there are so many companies like this that value opinions of people which are higher than you mm. and I, well, I I found it very difficult to work uh, in, in this hierarchical, hierarchical structure because I think that no matter where you are in this uh, ladder, you your opinion can be good and others can be good as well, but yours is better. But there is no proof. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time in, in when we make a decision in the industry, okay, let's do it this way. We are not working as, 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 as scientists, like let's do experiments, let's uh, have a control group and uh, a group A and group B. We don't have time to, to do this. So it's always like multiple opinions and we have mm -hmm. to choose one. So this is what I think uh, many companies uh, have problems with when they choose not, uh, that don't choose the opinions that uh, would be better for the company, but rather opinions that would be uh, like of higher, uh, coming from a higher uh, rank, uh, higher ranking person in the company. I think that uh, in, at Gartner, again, opinions value and everybody uh, listen to everyone, but we are still a, still, a, still a priority, so sometimes it's difficult, but I have to say, like, do it this way. I have mm -hmm. no choice. So 
being a manager to it's it's not always like you have resources and they uh, fascinate you sometimes you have to say well I value your opinion but you have to do it this way because I feel like from my experience I feel yeah. like the best way to do it. Yeah, well, I, th I think, Andrew, that from the way you've talked about your leadership style and the way that you the way that you hire and the people that you're looking for, um, you definitely have a lot of humility in the way that you lead, that you like your team to suggest ideas. You want um, the best ideas to come up and yeah. you are more than willing to let other ideas come up that, you th that you're like, you know what, that's a great way of doing it. I never thought of it, about it that way. Go for it. Mm -hmm. But then, like you said, there's certain times where you have competing ideas and as a leader, you have to choose one and you're going to make the best decision possible. And it may not be the way that the team wants to go, but you're like, I'm ultimately responsible for this project yeah, exactly. in my background, my experience. We should probably go this way. Yeah, because if you fail, it's not you fail, it's us failing. Mm -hmm. So us, including myself, and I will represent uh, the team and by saying, well, we we failed this project. It, it doesn't happen frequently, especially in what we do, because what we do uh, is very uncertain from the very beginning. Like you work with data, you don't know how good this data is, what kind of information you can extract from this data. Uh, so you have to try different approaches to transform this data into some machine readable format. You have to try different algorithms, different hyperparameters. You can be constrained with time, so you cannot try all all algorithms and all hyperparameters. So you have to focus on some specific heuristic uh, that you have in, in in your head. So um, I, I don't think that we w when we fail, we actually fail. It's like we either fail or we we either win or we learn, right? So uh, this is what I think we do. And I, I read online about the, uh, what uh, the typical machine learning team delivers. Uh, it's about 20% of uh, all projects uh, mm -hmm. uh, succeed, but 80% uh, either uh, fail or don't go in production because, as I said, sometimes they are too complex, too slow, uh, too unstable, and so on. So I, I think that there is no fail, but I still try to... Uh, uh, set the bar high for for my team so that if we like this say yeah we will work on this project we will deliver this prototype I actually try to do all my possible to actually deliver something and I really feel unhappy if uh, we don't deliver even if we try it at least mm -hmm. at least what what make me feel uh, like um, satisfied by my by my job is is that I try everything in the scope of the time that I have. I know that maybe there are 10 possible ways to solve this specific machine learning problem, but we only have time to try three. So let's do our best. Let's pick those three possible uh, uh, directions and try them. If we don't have a, a, any result, maybe those seven remaining contain some solution, but we all, all only had two months, let's say, to, to deliver something. So it's always a trade-off between um, delivering something uh, fast and delivering at all. You know, um, as you were talking, and I was taking notes because as you were talking about the people that you look for to join your team, you know, obviously the academic background and, and experience with, with programming languages and, and, and uh, maths is super important. But you also talked about... Um, uniqueness and having a deep understanding, knowing the why. Yeah. And you have done this with a book mm -hmm. that makes you unique. You've written a book called the hundred page machine learning book, um, which also shows your deep understanding in the subject because machine learning to be able to condense it down into, and, and you force yourself to condense it down to a hundred pages to summarize it shows you have a, uh, a detailed knowledge and also skill to take a very complex subject and bring it down into 100 pages to make it readable for yeah. those that are interested and applicable for people that are working in data science. Um, why was that book so important for you to write? And for those listening to the podcast, you got to go check it out. The URL is themlbook.com. But Andre, can you talk a little bit about why you yeah. wanted to write this book? 
Well, why uh, you you might uh, and then the listeners of uh, your show <laughs> might might take it a little bit like uh, uh, funny, but uh, actually I have uh, quite a, fol- uh, a lot of followers uh, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is not, is not considered by many marketing agencies like a uh, interesting uh, platform, but if you join and you start getting connections, you will quickly see that there is a lot of professionals out there who really look for uh, quality advice, like career advice or advice in technology, like for example, uh, machine learning or data science. And I joined at LinkedIn two years ago and uh, I started with like only my personal connections, like uh, 200 people. And today I have about uh, 80, 100, 80, 100, 80,000. Uh, wow. Followers. Yeah, so so I reached that in less than than two years. So I post sometimes very strong opinions, and not, not everyone uh, agree with me. And uh, myself neither. Sometimes I <laughs> next day I, I don't agree with this you just like to like stir the pot. <laughs> yeah. So, but but I like I like the the discussions that follows uh, the post. I like to read uh, like people say no, I'm not I, I'm not agree. So. Uh, there are discussions. I like I like to like sparkle sparkle the, the, the discuss, discussions. So it was like four four months ago. I wrote a post uh, that said that you know I think I, I I know the problem why machine learning is considered so like a rocket science and people really think it's it's difficult. It's because if you take any popular classical what they call book on machine learning. It has between five hundred or and thousand pages. Some of them wow. can have, can have twelve hundred pages. Wow. Or more. <laughs> so imagine, imagine a, a an engineer, okay, or a scientist from some other domain who says, "Wow, to everybody speak about uh, machine learning. I would like to learn it." So uh, they go to Amazon, they type machine learning, and there are like, for example, ten books. And they are all good with five stars or maybe four four point point five. So they read reviews, and some reviews says, "Wow, it's a very good book. A lot of detail. I used it at, uh, when I was student at, uh, at at Stanford, and it was fascinating." So you buy this book, but because you didn't study in Stanford, <laughs> uh, and you are you are just like normal mach- like computer programmer. You buy it. You open the first page, and it starts with some integrals, some some uh, derivatives, uh, some uh, crazy math notation that you forgot because it was so uh, so many years ago. So you tr- you try to read it because you believe those people who say that it's yeah. actually a good book, and you like you feel like it's a good book, but there is so many details inside that you are lost very quickly. Mm. For example, do I have to really know? Uh, uh, what this subsection, sub, 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 sub section actually explains, whether it's important in practice or not, Wh- whether I have to really uh, like break my head and try to really <laughs> understand this, or I can uh, just jump into to another section. And I said that if I was a machine learning book writer, my book would, ha- would have a hundred pages. Uh, Brilliant, I, Andre! You set yourself up there. Yeah, and and I, and, I, and I said it like this, and I didn't really plan to write a book. I just wanted to show <laughs> everyone that that books on machine learning today are so overly complicated. Mm. And this post has got about thousand uh, likes. Are you and, serious? Yeah, hundreds of co- co- comments, and there are, there were like two kinds of comments um, co- commonly. The first one. It's people who said it's impossible. Those books are so uh, thick for the reason it's because all details that they present are really important to understand machine learning. And the second kind of comments was, "Wow, Andre, we really need this book. Write it, please, mm. uh, because we struggle with it and we cannot find any good book to really like understand the whole wide range of machine learning." So I was like. I started to think about it, but not really seriously. And then uh, I talked to to my parents, and they said, "Well, try it. You have nothing to lose." 
and I wrote the first three chapters and the third chapters was actually about the most like uh, important machine learning algorithms like decision trees, uh, support vector machines, logistic regression, linear regression, and uh, near neighbors, near neighbors. And when I finished to write the, the third uh, chapter, I told myself like the, <laughs> the most complex part is already written. Then what's remaining is like just some practice and neural networks. But because neural networks are basically so simple, if you understand how they work, neural networks are just like uh, nested functions. For example, like the first, uh, the, like the last layer, it's a fun, it's a linear function uh, of the previous layer plus some nonlinearity that makes prediction. And the previous layer, it's uh, a function of the following layer. So it, it's quite simple if you uh, if you can understand how it works. So when, when I thought that the, the biggest part that remains is, much, is neural networks, I said, I will start putting chapters of my book online and I will see how people react to it. So I put the first three chapters in batch. So I created a website and I put, it, uh, I put uh, the, the three chapters online and I, uh, I wrote on my LinkedIn like, okay, you ask it uh, for a book, <laughs> here are the first three chapters, uh, let's see uh, how it goes. And I, in the beginning, I actually uh, hoped uh, to actually have like exactly 100 pages. But because uh, I wanted to put so many illustrations to simplify the reading, because when you see something, you, you understand it much better than through um, like uh, for formulas. So eventually, I uh, I stopped at 140 pages. So I told myself that it's still a 100 pages book. It's it's not 200, and it's even less than 150. So I will not change the name, and I really like it. <laughs> the 100 page machine learning book, and I I didn't expect any like uh, like bestseller st status whatsoever. But I think I was lucky because I sent. Uh, letters to uh, Peter Norvig, uh, who is the like icon in, in, in artificial intelligence. He, he is a research director at Google and he wrote uh, the, 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 the most uh, popular textbook on machine or on artificial intelligence called the Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, which was translated into a dozen of languages and is adapted as a textbook in most universities in the world. So I wrote him. I, I didn't really expect that he would uh, he would agree, but I, I said, uh, "Hi, uh, uh, Peter. I write a hundred-page machine learning book. I'm almost at the, at the end. And would you like to write a foreword for my book?" And he answered quite quickly by saying, uh, "I'm quite busy to write a foreword, but I could write a blurb uh, for you." And I oh. actually. I actually heard a lot about your book, so I'm interested. Send me the the, the, the full uh, the full book, and I sent it to him. And he, uh, after a couple of well, maybe three four weeks uh, of reading, he sent me he, his his blurb. And also, oh, I was wow. lucky that another very popular uh, author of of a practical machine learning book, uh, Aurelien Geron, who wrote a book about uh, like machine learning in Python with scikit-learn and TensorFlow, which is one of the most uh, popular, I would say the most popular practical machine learning book out there. And he actually loved my book and he wrote another blog. So I get, I've got uh, Peter Norvig and Aurelien Geron, wow. who are extremely ta talented, who extremely respected in the AI community. So they uh, endorsed my book. So I was like, in the beginning, I was some guy, but now I was some guy endorsed by those uh, those respected and very talented people and also i because i posted every chapter one by one as soon as they were ready online every other week or so a lot of people read it at the same time as i i, I wrote it and i've got so many uh, mm. recommendations how to improve the text how to uh, rewrites uh, certain sentences to uh, so it, it it sounds better f uh, as English because English is not my first language, of course. And I would say that about sixty 
people participated in improving oh. the quality. And I, from the very beginning, I promise it to people that this will be what I invented, uh, read first, buy later uh, book. So <laughs> I, I invented this principle because I, I said that if someone wants to pirate your book, your book will be pirated. Mm -hmm. There, everybody knows places online where you can download basically any technical books for free. It's called it privacy, uh, piracy, and it's uh, 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 it's like part of our life. We cannot do anything with it. Uh, those libra libraries exist for years. Mm. Nobody does anything. So I, I told to myself, if I try to like hide my chapters and try to publish yeah. uh, and not give anyone any idea about the book, the book will not get any visibility. But if I just put it online myself, go on, read it. But if you like it, it if you found it uh, important for your business studies, uh, uh, just for you personally, then buy it because, well, you read it and you appreciate it. So the, every every work uh, has to be remunerated somehow. So if you read the book, you should pay for it. But Another reason why I did it is that I, all, I was always like, you buy a book, but you cannot really know if it's a good book for you or not. You can even not know if it's a good book at all, because, yes, yeah, some books have uh, lots of reviews on Amazon, but you don't know those people. And some books have just three, five reviews. Maybe uh, they were given by friends, uh, mem uh, members of family. So when you buy a book, you risk. It's like uh, uh, putting uh, in, in casino, putting on, yep. on red and trying to trying to win. So I remove this gambling uh, from from my from my book experience. So you, there is no gamble. Read it entirely, and if you like it, buy it. Honest people buy. Dishonest, anyway, wouldn't buy. They would go to uh, some piracy website and download. So I, I don't think that I really missed some financial opportunity. I think that the visibility that I've got with my book played well for me. And also I feel proud that, for example, uh, students from India or from uh, Bangladesh, from some uh, African country, they write me and say, Andre, we heard uh, so much about your book, but we can afford it. And even if we could, we don't have any credit cards here to pay for the book online. Can can I read it somehow? And I say, sure, there is a website. And I make sure that the quality of the book is always improved because people keep sending me some, mm. some improvements. So I can say, sure, go on and read it. Read my book for free. Maybe my book will allow you to find a job as a machine learning engineer, as a data scientist or a whatever manager. And then you will be like, capable of affording this book it can be it can happen this year in two years in 10 years but eventually you will say well when i read this book my careers started to to go up and thanks to this book i am who i am now uh, i would pay 30 dollars uh, for for this to the author who changes my my mm. uh, my, my life so so well and i gave an, as an example uh, on reddit uh, as well when i was young uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, all music that I could buy in my city was pirated. Everybody knew that every music store sells only pirate uh, pirated. Mm. It was uh, either stereo cassettes or stereo cassettes or uh, laser disc. They look it like like completely genuine with, yeah, yeah. Uh, with graph with color graph color pictures uh, everything is good but everybody knew that it's not legal but because there were no choice other than that people bought it and uh, i i i once i by just by chance i bought a um, album of a group an english group called it morchiba and today uh, it's considered quite uh, known but I was like, uh, I, I was 19 and Marchiba just released their first album. And by, by chance, I bought like a, a disc of one singer and there were three bonus tracks of Marchiba on this disc. And I felt completely in love with, the, with this music. So I, I started to run around the whole city and find the music store 
where I could fi find their album and I found it in one place. And I listened to Marchiba like every day, like like in the loop, or like just it, 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 it stops, it ends and you restart it. And then there was a second album and a third album. And I knew that I paid to pirate for this, but I had no choice. Mm -hmm. And then when I got a job and I, I started to like buy legal music, uh, like use uh, uh, Spotify or uh, iTunes, I said myself that Marchiba was a huge uh, factor in my uh, music, in informing my music taste, and I still love it, and they do good music. So I bought all their albums. That is so cool. Yeah, I bought it because I, I yeah. had this, I had this music. Yeah, yeah. I bought the albums because I knew that they will be remunerated for 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 this. It was important for me. The song. Mm. Paid. So I think that for for my book, it I hope that it will be the same. I don't expect that all people will pay for it. Uh, I, I'm not an idiot. I know that some some people uh, download for free and don't even ask questions like uh, should I pay author or not. But I think that reasonable people, people who are honest, when they open the book and it, they read the first thing, like the first page that says it's a read first, buy later book, <laughs> it's like a contract, okay, with your yeah. own with your own self-respect. Right, right. After this, you continue reading, you are signing this contract. If you don't pay after this, well, it's your life. I cannot judge you for this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I, I think it's, I love your approach. Um, first of all, the fact that you like, you know, took the challenge from the LinkedIn community to like put together this book. And then the fact that you did it in such a short period of time, um condensing everything down uh to really benefit the data science community and people that want to do a better job in machine learning like you you put your heart and soul into this and then instead of just selling it you're like i want the community to help me with this yeah. so you're sharing your chapters crowdsourcing information getting feedback fixing the book in real time making adjustments making it better and better and better and then you could have just packaged it up and just sold it on Amazon or wherever, but you have decided to give it to the community and say, um, you know, please read this. And if you find this valuable, if this helps you in your career, please, you know, buy the book. And yeah. I think that's a model. Yeah, and this uh, read first by later, I I said from the very beginning that the book will remain uh, remain that even after I publish it uh, in, in print. And when uh, I announced it to everyone that uh, the book is available on Amazon, many people were worried, like, what will happen with this website with those uh, with those uh, chapters? And I said, nothing will happen, and I will actually improve it all the time. So if you buy the book and you find some uh, some mistakes it, it happened uh, you can always check uh, with uh, on the website and see that most likely the, the this mistake was already fixed uh, on the with the online version and also uh, i think that once you engage into something you have to hold uh, to your word so even if like some greedy part in my in my head says, "Well, you, you lose you lose sales because people can read it." Uh, the reasonable part in my head says, "You promised it. People participated in it, and you have to keep it free because it would be a disrespect to those who believed in your cause, believed that they will the, the book will make a difference, and they helped you on the promise that." The book will always remain available to everyone. So I would, I, I keep my website. Uh, I pay, I pay for it, and I will keep paying uh, as soon as uh, I have money to pay for it. If at some point I have no money, I will just put it uh, on GitHub or something like this, and it will remain available to everyone forever. And I really hope that this book will make a difference and will. Uh, let uh, people who if are afraid of math are afraid of like uh, machine learning because it sounds so complicated because maybe only PhD who work for Google can do it. 
I really hope that those people will read good reviews online, will open my book on its website, read the first, the second, the third chapter, see that it's not so complicated as it might seem, and then they will go to Amazon and they will buy a paper book because it's a amazing quality. I, when, when I received the, 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 the first print, I never believed that a book could look better mm -hmm. in life than it looks on the screen on, of my Mac. I always thought that my Mac screen is like the best that you can actually have, like the, the juicy colors and so on. But in the book, it's even better. And all people who bought it say, Andre, we never thought that book can be of such a high quality. Of course, I like, for example, just printing this book cost $12. So, uh, Twelve dollars just to print, but you also have to pay the uh, uh, the interest uh, to Amazon, and you have to keep some some royalty. So the price of a high high quality book cannot be like twelve dollars or less because just printing it costs costs twelve dollars. But by the way, I just recently uh, launched a uh, Indian or South Asian edition of the book. Oh. It was completely redesigned for uh, for India, and um, it, it was printed in India, and it's now available on Amazon in India, and it costs uh, almost twice less than than the price, list price of my book uh, on Amazon in US. So it, it, it's two times uh, less, but I didn't uh, compromise quality at all. It's still high quality paper in color paperback. So. Uh, but finally, uh, I have I already signed contracts to to, uh, to translation of my book in Chinese and in Korean, and I am in about to sign a contract with Russian and German uh, editors for. Oh my gosh, book. that is fantastic! Yeah, so I I uh, understand that some markets are not as big as the as the U.S., but I heard a lot from people in Russia that. They prefer. They still prefer to read in Russian. I, for example, I think that uh, anything computer science today has to be written and published in English and read as well. Because I think that, like, the translation part it creates a kind of wall between mm -hmm. uh, between, like, for example, you are a scientist in Russia and you read everything about machine learning in Russia and you read only scientific papers written by Russians in Russia, there are high chances that what you believe is state of the art is actually not at all anymore because a machine learning field evolves so quickly, so it's, so it's hard to really like be the first. Everyone is uh, the second uh, today. Like uh, At the moment you think about some new idea, everyone is in China or in the mm. US already working on it. So even and when you create this additional additional barrier like translation, you are even behind all those uh, all the, this train who which runs very fast. But I can I can respect that some people don't know English very well, but still want to know machine learning, want to be able to program some machine learning solutions. So for those people, I agree on translation. And myself, I don't do this tra the translation even in Russian, even if I could. Because I don't know machine learning terms uh, mm. in Russian. I don't know them well. I, I could Google them, but it, it wouldn't be, it would be a, a, like a, a job mm. on its own to write a good quality machine learning text in Russian. So I, I, I write a, a contract with the best technical book uh, publisher in Russia, and they will handle the translation part. I will just read it to make the question for me because I want it to be highest quality possible and I am not the, the, this person to guarantee this high quality in Russia. Wow. Well, Andre, you know, uh, here's another challenge, an audio book. <laughs> to, be able to, yeah. to be able to do it in, you know, that, would be, that would be crazy. You know what? I was so surprised to actually realize that this, uh, besides iOS, there is no platform, so exclu we exclude Amazon, we exclude Kindle. They cannot, oh. they cannot uh, uh, render 
math in books in, right in, in, in ebooks yeah it was so crazy i was like it's 2019 yeah. and <laughs> only only apple managed to support math in ebooks you know that there is a, a, a format called epub where yeah, all I know EPUB, yeah. Yeah, most, most electronic books uh, are in this format so epub starting 2010 supports mathematical uh, mark markdown and google doesn't support it and uh, kindle fascinating wow that's, so that's, that's that's sad yeah it's very sad and i think the only reason why it's because there is no mm, so many buyers who actually request uh, technical books on small devices because when, when you read the technical books some equations can be quite wide and uh, maybe people feel like it's not the best format but i think it's like a chicken and egg again you don't produce high quality uh, math books were in on on a mobile format and people got used the, to, to the fact that they they don't exist but apple made this effort to support math beautifully and i created the epub version of my book that is so cool available on uh, itunes but i was so frustrated that i cannot uh, put it on google play for example or on, on yeah. Amazon or kindle and so talking about audio so if we cannot communicate equations in 2019 forget about like um, communicating something uh, in voice <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have to figure out I, I think it'd be I think it'd be awesome if you were able to get it, have someone read it, you yeah. know, um, or you can read it, and then um, at least you have an audio version of it. Because I don't, that would be um, another level, making it more accessible. Yeah, well, I, I was contacted by uh, by some people who would like to make of my book some interactive experience, like it would be mm. kind of book, but once you get to some uh, some illustration you might uh, have some kind of sliders and you you change the parameters and you see how graphs oh. evolve something like this would be interesting to do but uh, just audio book you cannot read equation you have to sh you have to show it so uh, like you can listen but at some point the 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 narrator yeah. has to say now <laughs> open your eyes and yeah. look at the screen <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right there there's limitations yeah <laughs> um for sure well um for those uh for those listening in uh google the 100 page machine learning book uh you can also go directly to the site which is the mlbook.com you can see um the 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 uh the outline for the book the different sections you will see all the recommendations from all these amazing data scientists, the VP of AI at LinkedIn, the head of data science at Amazon and Google, and um, just, um, just the amazing list of people who have been uh, reviewing the book and recommending the book. So if you're interested in learning more about machine learning, you wanna stay up to date in what's happening, um, or you're just curious, um, you want to get a book that's going to summarize things for you, and um, and like uh, Andre was saying, um, there are so many books that are out there about machine learning, but sometimes they're very academic, or they're you know a thousand pages thick. Andre has condensed things down to make it very simple and um, easy to understand. He put it together in 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 a book called the Hundred Page Machine Learning Book with plenty of examples. Um, so please check it out. Again, the URL is themlbook.com. Andre, for those that want to reach out and connect with you, um, if they go to themlbook.com, can they find your LinkedIn profile there? Uh, yep. Uh, so on the website, there is a FAQ section on the bottom uh, where I put my email and uh, my uh, li links to my profiles online. So I have Twitter, I have uh, LinkedIn, Unfortunately, I had Google Plus, but Google Plus decided to uh, to shut down, which is very, very frustrating for me because mm. all my communications with my family, all pictures of my kids, oh no, I all put there. Yeah, I believe so much that Google will 
will at least keep it or at least not shut it down but let people pay for it paid account like like i don't know i pay 30 uh, 13 for netflix how much should it cost uh, to uh, keep uh, alive my google plus for uh, right 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 so yeah so um yeah so it's uh, it's uh, twitter or it's linkedin or it's email write me i always uh, answer to everyone at least uh, by saying that i cannot do what people ask me to do <laughs> but i try to answer to everyone and give some advice for example career advice or uh, for example i read this book uh, what you recommend uh, like if uh, like a subsequent reading uh, so I, I try to help people and um, I, as i say everyone i am uh, i am uh, to say, uh, happily divorced so uh, i have my kids one week with me and another mm. week with their mother so i have one week where i can really like answer all, all this mail and give, give advice and post something interesting uh, online so um, don't hesitate to, to write me if you, if you have questions. Awesome. Well, Andre, thank you so much for sharing your academic journey with us. Um, thank you for letting us know how you lead your data science team. Um, so cool to hear about um, your process for, pi for finding curious and gritty people. Um, and also, I just love your authenticity and humility. Um, in all of that and how you how you're leading your team and open to ideas and looking for the best ways of accomplishing things um, it's beautiful to see people like you who um, who are stellar in their field but also extremely humble um, it's very rare to find that um, and also somebody who is uh, unique and um, giving back to the community and helping the data science, data science community by producing a book and letting it evolve over time and now getting it in different languages. It's so cool to see the work that you're doing. So thank you um, for everything you're doing. And it's um, been lovely and wonderful chatting with you, Andre, and hopefully we can touch talk again very soon. It was the same for me. I've got a uh, pleasure to talk to you, Mike. And uh, I think that uh, it was one of the best conversations uh, I've got uh, uh, about my background and uh, uh, overall about uh, life <laughs> in general um, it was my second uh, podcast uh, in, in my life so I think uh, I don't know how you feel uh, I think it's awesome I, I loved it I loved it okay because yesterday I was supposed to have two uh, one uh, one before yours but because yesterday we have some technical difficulties it was postponed but now I I, I think that I will accept more podcasts because people always like asking me whether I want to participate in this and that. And I always consider it myself not a public person, but I think this format is quite uh, quite entertaining and quite like relaxed. Uh, I like it. So yeah, so if you want at some point uh, to talk to me about uh, anything else, maybe the second 100-page uh, book. Where I'm Definitely. Kidding. I'm, I'm kidding because I don't think that I will write uh, anything any soon. Uh, anytime soon because it's a lot a lot a lot of energy and time and time you not spent with your with your family I I, 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 I I tried it I find it fascinating people who are able to write more than 200 pages mm. and to be consistent and to not make a lot of mistakes and to finish like a thousand page book oh my god those people are are really heroes and at the same time people are not able to finish the, their books because there is <laughs> so much inside so yeah so i uh, thank you and uh, anytime uh, awesome. like, and i will be happy to talk to you again thank you andre it was a blast chatting with you um again everybody uh google the 100 page machine learning book um, or go to the mlbook.com check out the book uh connect with andre follow him on linkedin um like you said he's very active on linkedin and um, sharing lots of different um interesting posts and andre likes to like as you said stir up the pot <laughs> get some good conversation going if you yeah. disagree he's yeah as you can tell he loves the challenge he loves to 
uh, talk about things and and discuss things. So uh, connect with them there. And um, looking forward to definitely having Andre back in the future, especially uh, when things slow down for him and uh, maybe he's writing his next book. Uh, but Andre is so cool about the um, the that now that you're working now that you're, the book is done now you're working on all the translations and um, different versions maybe interactive in the future so yeah. so cool and looking forward to catching up soon. Sure, and I would say that uh, the, the the biggest challenge when you work on translating your book is to negotiate uh, fair conditions with publishers because publishers uh, they try to offer you like something very basic because they assume that like you're self-published you don't know how the how the industry works so i don't <laughs> have i don't have any any agent to represent me so i have to be like author and agent. you're doing it all <laughs> right? uh, it, it's it's so time consuming but now i i realize better what uh, how this industry works so um, it's it's a story on its own maybe i will write about this uh, how, how those negotiations went at some point. Awesome. Andre, thanks again. We'll chat soon. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.